Hi, I'm Karen. Welcome to Texas Farmstead Living. On today's video, I'm going to share with you how we are managing our dairy and beef cattle during the Texas summer drought 2022. I'm also going to share with you some tips that I think will help you develop your own drought plan. And at the end of this video, I'm going to share with you some scenes from the 38th annual DOS Volunteer Fish Fry this last weekend. DOS is a little German community uh, close to Fredericksburg, Texas, and I think you'll really enjoy uh, seeing some of the old-fashioned celebrating that the Germans do in the Texas Hill Country. This year has been devastating for Texas ranchers and farmers due to drought, extreme high temperatures, and escalating input cost. After the 2011 drought, we realized that we needed to begin the journey of learning from the past and move towards implementing a new ranching strategy, which meant for us a whole new paradigm. We were this year better positioned uh, for drought and we fared so far a lot better. We have only culled cattle that needed to be culled and we have kept our breeding stock. But in 2011, that was not the case. We had to cull half of our cattle herd and we were desperate. We were so desperate that we were going to the ranch and taking a flamethrower and burning a prickly pear for the cattle to eat until we could get them shipped out. So here we are at 2022 and I think uh, we are managing <laughs> quite a bit differently. And so I thought uh, that I would share with you the three key topics that I think have really helped us manage during the drought and that you know, that will give you some ideas of what you need to do to develop your own drought plan. The first topic I want to discuss is education. After the 2011 drought, we knew that we had to learn to manage our cattle, grazing, and how our ecosystem functions. So in 2013, I took a class from Holistic Management International called Beginning Farming and Ranching Women in Texas. So I went through that program and I can't even tell you how life-changing that was for, for me personally and for my ranch. Okay, the second um, resource for education is Alan Savory has the Savory Institute. And you can go online and find a Savory Hub and they offer classes and um, he's just phenomenal um, you know it's just phenomenal um, his ideas and we all need to you know even if you aren't farming and ranching it is I think you can apply this to your daily life okay so there's two great resources that you can take classes okay there's um, the book you should buy the book by Alan Savory uh, we we got this book this was in HMI we we had the book in that class but uh, you should buy this book um, also two more resources is it there's a weekly episodes or weekly podcast of herd quitters podcast which is uh, I believe sponsored by Pharaoh cattle company in Colorado Kit Pharaoh has a weekly um, newsletter really great information I keep up with it um, also, there is the Working Cow podcast, which I listen to weekly. So there's um, some really good resources that a good place to start and kind of uh, see what, what you need to do. And so another uh, documentary that I love and I tell people to watch is Kiss the Ground, which is on Netflix. Um, Alan Savory is um, actually on that documentary and I think it's a, a really important video for us all to see and um, we always have to remember we're growing soul not plants. 
Another publication that I think is really important that has really helped me and that you could subscribe to is the Stockman Grass Farmer. And I think it, it's a monthly publication and I think it would really, really help you. The second topic that I want to discuss is genetics. I can't tell you how important this is to uh, select for low input grass-based genetics. I learned this uh, back when I had a Jersey Bull from Ben Gotchel, which is Holt Creek Jersey's grass-based genetics. That bull was phenomenal. Bruno, he lived here for I think seven years and he stayed gorgeous the whole time. I don't think we did one thing. He, he never was sick once. So what you want is you want to select for, you know, there's always cattle that are uh, stay fat no matter what. They're uh, easy keeper, I guess. They calve first in the herd uh, on time. They're just, you know, that's what you want. You want to select for those genetics. Um, I mentioned before that Kit Pharaoh, I follow him and that same philosophy of uh, smaller cattle and hardier cattle and your cow needs to earn her place in your herd and that's both beef and dairy so if you'll do that when hard times come around you'll still have a, a cow that is a, a survivor and that's uh, kind of what over the years back from 2011 we've culled aggressively and so the cows we have are the best of the best um, so we haven't really um, I mean, we had to sell a few cows that were missing teeth, but that's about all um, that we've had to do. And, and I have a lot of footage from at the ranch and those cattle have, you know, very little inputs, uh, if at all, and they look in great condition. We've got some footage of when, like right when the rain started, and uh, I have a video coming out in a few days that um, after, this is a couple of weeks later, that you can see how much the cattle, how much weight that they've gained. So select both dairy and beef genetics, grass-based, low input, and you, you want to work towards smaller cattle. And I think this is completely why we are, why things have gone so well or as best they can during a drought for us. The third topic I want to discuss is managing your grazing and managing your soil and forages. This topic is so vast, we could spend hours and hours and hours discussing it. But what I want the takeaway to be for you is um, I want you to understand that you are going to have to understand your soil and your geographic location and the grasses that are native to your area. Um, our rainfall is 26 inches a year in our county. Now, I think at my farm where I live, there was around four inches for the year. Um, but we just got back from Montana visiting a ranch and that rainfall was around 15 annual inches and their cattle were so beautiful and so fat. So, you know, there's so many key factors in understanding um, an ecosystem. So you're just gonna have to learn about your soil, your rainfall, your mineral cycles, um, your carbon. There's just so many things and those resources for education will definitely help you do that. At our farm, uh, because we have such a semi-arid brittle environment, it really takes little rainfall for our native grasses and they will grow because they're adapted to drought. And so when we do get a little sprinkle here or a little, you know, an inch of rain, it does a lot of good and it can really turn cattle around fast. So that's another um, thing you're just going to have to explore your geographic location. Okay, one thing during drought is most people open all the gates to every pasture and just hope that their cows can eat everything up. That is the opposite of what we do. When we see drought coming, and in any way, even if there is no drought, we 
use managed grazing and we keep our cattle grazing in one area before we move them to the next. So it's kind of like we always have a grass bank um, going, a savings grass bank. So a couple of strategies that we use, and I know most people can't do this, but, um, and I think Greg Judy uh, talks a lot about this, um, leasing land. So in our area, fast becoming populated and people um, have the smaller ranchettes and they wanna get their agriculture exemption. So they'll ask us to come in with cattle and, and let them graze it off and then we'll move on to the next place. So that works really well. We train our cattle, um, I've got a video of that, to just pretty much jump on the trailer because they know they're going to the next great place. But what we do, so we'll go into a place, you know, a year, maybe yearly, graze it, move on to the next place. And then some places, you know, we do have to go twice a year. We, we try to just go once a year, but, but sometimes we go twice. We'll do, just leave it um, forages for winter and then we'll let them graze the faster growing, you know, if it's rainy in the summer. Another thing is we leave some, like right now, even though we did get some rain, we have a 450 acre ranch just sitting there for a year with grass. So we weren't to that level of emergency yet, but you always want to have some forages saved. I can't emphasize that enough. And so when the drought started, we took all the cattle from all the lease places and we put everything at one ranch and we, we put them in a smaller area and we went and fed hay and some alfalfa. Um, now we live quite a ways from that ranch so and gas is really high, so we could only go to that ranch about twice a week. Um, but that's how we managed um, now that it's rained we're still going to manage our forages. Uh, we have the cattle in still one area. We're saving our the another giant, like, uh, let's see, that's a 750 acre ranch. We're saving half of it for winter. Um, we were showing you some video of visiting different lease places of um, how they're doing because the grass needs to recover some before we put cattle back out there. Also, um, we have some footage of a ranch that's near Junction, Texas, and I don't think I've ever quite seen such a devastated um, soil. Uh, the termites, the grass died, and, and we had taken cattle off a long time ago, so um, it was just sitting there, I guess, dried out. The termites ate the whole, everything. Everything did, everything wooded. So we're waiting to see right now if they ate the seeds, if anyone knows. Let us know below because we're we're hoping it's a 400 acre ranch and um so some of our another um thing that is important is you've really got to have low stocking rates we have a lot of different you know counties that we have cattle in and in some of them like this 400 acre ranch it will really only hold like maybe five to seven cattle and at the ranch where we combined all the herd, um, that ranch, can, it's 700 acres. It can only have about 20 to 25 cows, even when things are, are going well. Because you, you know, even like right now at rain, we could put 40 cows, there'd be enough because it's growing, but, but you've got to stockpile some forage. Can't emphasize that enough. Low stocking rate, that's what we do. Okay, a couple more ideas on the dairy cattle, and this made a gigantic difference. Now, the dairy cattle live with us, the Jerseys, is every day you want to not let them lose condition. You want to give them a little, you know, feed them every day. Make sure they're getting some protein. Um, and also, Dr. Will Winters, DVM, he was on a podcast and and he also has some books and he has an online presence. But I was, uh, he was talking about in one of his uh, podcasts that you could really um, efficient use of feed if you would feed, you know, give them apple cider vinegar, which we already have given our dairy cows, but we just made sure we gave each of them around a fourth to a half a cup daily. 
And we really saw that help digestion and a good utilize their feet. Very important when there's not many, you know, inputs are high and not many resources. Another thing I did is I took Redmond salts and made brine water for them and mineralize them. So I think that really helped. They are in a fantastic condition. Um, they're having, they have not been able to graze. Uh, you know, it seems like this has been going on for several years. I think we might have had four inches last year, or I mean, for a year, and then pretty much a couple of years, the last couple of years have been really, really tough. And our inputs, um, I just ordered my organic alfalfa pellets for my dairy cows doubled in price so we're all going to have to get creative in how we uh, manage our forages and our uh, our cat the things our cattle eat we have to get creative but i hope this will help you because i think you know just stocking rate closing the gates apple cider vinegar and never let those cows get drop off in condition just keep them you know keep them in really good condition because once they drop off it's really hard to bring a, a a cow that's lactating back i hope this foraging managing forages and managing your grace and grazing is very very specific to your geographic location and uh, there's just so many factors um, but here texas hill country it takes lots of acres per cow uh, to make this this work and I'd say what we're doing is we're only stocking half of the land that we manage the other half is just stockpiling the forages so I hope this video helped you we're get, we uh, I want to make sure you understand you want to get a great education go uh, holistic management holistic management international uh, savory Institute really great podcast and i'm sure there's a ton more out there uh, there's some really good books on um, rotational grazing i know joel, joel saladin's got a lot of great books on that and speaking of that we do where we move cattle but we only do that we we have uh, we just move pastures at the places because they're like 30 miles away from our house but at home we do uh, manage the cattle through rotational grazing. Um, so I hope education helped you. I hope that you will get some low input genetics and grass-based genetics. And thirdly, I hope you will be able to uh, learn to manage your forages and your cattle's grazing. So I think those are the, the key points today that have really helped us now drought is not fun it's really hard it's really expensive but big difference between roofer ranch managing the drought of 2022 and managing the drought of 2011. thank you for watching and please watch more of our videos and please subscribe to this channel and from our texas hill country to you have a blessed day and we will see you in the next video bye bye they used to have it down there.